Hi everyone, thank you for joining us on today's webinar. My name is Bethany and I'm the Relationship and Engagement Manager here at UMI. And today I'm joined by my colleague Jamie, who is our Partnerships Director of the Cell. Hi everyone. Here at UMI, we help businesses by taking the hard work out of finding the very best expertise, information and finance. That's why we're here today with one of the very best experts on coaching skills training for leaders. Before we dive in, if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the Q&A chat box in your Zoom control panel. We'll try and answer them as we go, but we'll also have time for questions at the end. Now, without further ado, today we're here to explore how you can develop a leader as coach culture within your business. And on that note, I'd like to introduce our guest. So today we have Matt from Matt Summers Coaching Skills Limited. Hi, Matt. Would you like to tell us a little bit more about yourself and what you do? Yeah, uh, hello Bethany, hello everyone, great great to be here, thanks for having me on. Um, I could loosely be described as uh, a coach, uh, I guess, but um, what I've always been more interested in, I suppose, is the idea of um, the coach within the business rather than somebody that we hire in from outside, the idea that managers and leaders in particular uh, can and ought to be uh, the coach to their team to drive performance out of those guys. Um, and that's always been something that I've been very interested in, and it's been, I suppose, the centerpiece of my business for oh, the thick end of 20 years now. So uh, something that um, I've encountered a lot and still do, and uh, it raises as many questions as it answers. So it's a, it's a truly fascinating uh, topic, and um, I'm sure we'll get into the fact that COVID has really kind of put a lot of this stuff under the microscope um, and had leaders really thinking about uh, whether coaching might be a way of um, managing and uh, developing their teams through this and, and of course beyond. Yeah. That's cracking, thanks Matt. Um, I totally agree as well, I think being within that business as well um, and actually getting your hands on is quite an important um, element to what you're doing which is fantastic. Um, can you just let us know what some of the benefits are of developing that leader as a coach culture? Yeah, so I think um, there are and always have been, uh, Jamie, some, some generic benefits. I mean, <laughs> Driving up performance is, is probably first amongst that. Um, improving the quality of, of working relationships because we're improving the quality of conversations. Um, those, those kind of things. But I think particularly at the moment with, with COVID and the lockdown, uh, the one that I think is, is most interesting and perhaps most important is the idea that if, if we're trying to lead through this um, with the old model and by the old model I mean this idea of the leader as expert right so you know you're the leader of the team and you're supposed to be the one with the answers and if people uh, call you up because they have a problem um, you're supposed to say well here's how to solve that problem I'm, I'm the leader I'm going to lean into my experience I've encountered this before here you go you know off you, off you go and put that into operation that isn't going to work at the moment. You know, COVID-19 has come along and ripped all that up because there aren't any answers. You know, nobody's, and this year, very, very ancient and you're around at the time of the Spanish flu. Nobody's really lived through this before. So how does the leader go about um, solving problems? How does the leader go about um, helping their team find answers where nobody's ever had to really think about these things before? So... I, I'm very amused to see on, on LinkedIn and other places all sorts of uh, webinars and reports on how to deal with COVID as if people, or perhaps they've been away on some parallel universe, you know, that, that I'm not aware of, where they've been through this before and figured it all out. In, in my view, nobody really has those answers and we need to be sceptical, I think, about uh, people who claim that they have because what's needed instead of that I think is a coaching approach because the coaching approach says well you know let's let's figure this out together let's let's see what your ideas are I'm the leader yes but that doesn't mean necessarily that um, I'm the only one that can uh, foresee a solution or come up with an idea so coaching has always come with multiple benefits I think the biggie at the moment uh, Jamie for leaders is it, it frees them from this pressure of having to have an answer uh, all, all the time in these yeah bizarre times yeah and I guess with that coaching model as well there's that, that opportunity to understand your own business a little bit more particularly as the external environment changes so much yeah well so leaders are often a couple of steps removed from the customer aren't they so uh, again 
uh, what coaching has us doing if we adopt that as a leadership communication style is tapping into people who are closer to the customer. Uh, and I suppose, again, you know, currently, if those customers' needs have been completely ripped up and, um, uh, and been reset, then we really need to be hearing from the people that are hearing from the customer as leaders. You know, they can be um, this great source of information to us as we think about making leadership decisions. It takes some of the guesswork out of it. You know, yeah. we can plug into the people who are actually hearing uh, the voice of the customer, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so how does the coaching approach compare then to the likes of training? Yeah. <laughs> So um, that's, that's always a very uh, interesting question. And it's one, Bethany, that doesn't have, um, I suppose, a, a hard and fast or a black and white answer. And, and one way to think about it, though, that I found useful is to think about which way the wisdom flows. OK, so if I'm going to uh, train you or teach you or instruct you or direct you, then the, the supposition there is that I've got some wisdom that you don't have my job is to get it out of my head and, and into yours. And all of those things, training, teaching, directing, it, it flows in that direction. So coaching rather swaps that around and says, the wisdom comes from you. If I'm, if I'm coaching you, you know, I'm accepting that you are the expert in your own experience and that you can come up with your own solutions. I just need to kind of guide and help your brain find them. So with coaching, um, the wisdom flows the other way around. You know, it comes from within you and we, we make it conscious, I suppose, um, and make it available to you. So with, with training and those other things, it comes from the more expert to the less expert, I suppose. Uh, with coaching, it's more about kind of liberating what somehow people probably already know uh, at some level, but gets um, uh, obscured by other things that are going on uh, in their lives. Mm -hmm. And so I guess some people, many people might think that they don't necessarily have the qualities to be a coach. Now, do you, do you feel that any leader could be a coach? And, you know, is there any sort of personal qualities that, um, that are required in order to be, to be one? Yeah. So um, I'm reminded, Jamie, of the line, I think it was in the film uh, Jurassic Park that says just because you can doesn't mean that you should. So, um, yeah, it, it, in my experience, I think any leader can be a coach because at, at some level it's a fairly simple and straightforward set of tools and techniques that yeah you know if you're in a leadership position you're probably bright enough to be able to adopt those um, but some people take it to it quicker than others there are in my experience natural born coaches and, and some people um, at the other end of the spectrum for whom it's always going to be a bit of a struggle you know they're just not people people they're not kind of built that way but they, they can probably do a do a job of it um, in that so, sense, sorry. anybody can not not everybody should maybe yeah so i was just thinking in that sense is there um any sort of tools and techniques that can enable a leader if they don't feel that they've got that coaching quality to follow um well um i yeah i don't know how sort of uh controversial I can be on these webinars and <laughs> they can be up, up on the internet for, for all the time but um, you know perhaps the simplest technique of all uh, in order to adopt a coaching approach is just to shut up um, a lot of leaders I think um, labor under the, 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 the misapprehension that leadership is about noise you know that they've got to be demonstrative that they've got to be saying stuff they've got to be issuing directions and being quite 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 loud and, uh, and and obvious in that way well again coaching has us looking at things from a rather different angle that says if people are to find their own answers if we're to coach that out of them then one of the real great tools and techniques that we can adopt is just to be quiet just mm. to listen to them just to allow them to speak just to um, be comfortable with pauses to to accept that within silence is an opportunity for somebody to think and if we really let people in a work situation think to a higher degree of quality than would be typical then that's when they come up with the insights that's when they come up with the innovations that's when the light bulb goes off you know but they, they'll not find those things in an environment that's that's too noisy because we just can't hear ourselves think quite literally so if i wanted to say to any kind of leader that wanted to adopt a coaching approach very quickly, wanted a sort of a quick start guide, you know, without really having to get into the weeds. I'd say be quiet, just 
do that. Just, just close your mouth and let people speak. You know? And I know it sounds a bit harsh, but um, it, it, it's a, it's a, it's very powerful um, when we can learn to do it. No, good point. Yeah. And sorry, just winding back to something else you asked as well. I mean, alongside that, in terms of other qualities, um, I think key amongst them then would be listening. I mean, on my uh, training courses, we get into producing lists of uh, typical coaching qualities. And I cannot remember a time, and I've done this a long, long time, years and years, where the first thing that people have shouted out, and I said, tell me what you're, you would look for in an effective coach or in a leader that's going to, manage you in a coaching way they said just just listen that's what we want from our our leaders at work and to, to to have a voice to be listened to you know for them to pay us high quality attention so i think listening being quiet and, and empathy the ability to just sort of understand where somebody else is coming from even when you might not necessarily have had that experience yourself those first things would be key yeah good point and as an extension then of qualities, what strategies or frameworks can leaders adopt, you know, in order to be able to coach their employees, especially from a remote space? Yeah, so, I mean, I think there's, there's probably two, two elements to that. In terms of frameworks, um, I mean, a lot of people tuning into this, if they've thought about coaching before or encountered it before, will probably be familiar with the GROW model. So it's, a, it's an acronym that stands for GOALS Reality. Uh, options and will and this suggests that in, in taking a coaching conversation through a, a kind of natural start to finish process from understanding what the situation is you would then explore well, what, what's the goal you know what what is it we're trying to get to what would a, a solution look like what's the reality in other words where then do we start from um, options become what could we do uh, about those things or better yet what could you do uh, about those things and then the will is is gauging the willingness or setting out a way forward if you prefer to to turn uh, pick one or more of those options and turn that into some action steps so this takes me back to what I was just saying is this is a, a simple technique you know it, it takes no time at all to just learn how to to use that and start to adopt a, a questioning approach um, that being said, you know, there, there is, of course, um, a lot more to coaching than that if we really get into it. And I would be doing a disservice to people who train for years and years to suggest that it's a question of asking four questions. It isn't. There's a lot more to that. But there's an easy structure that if people want to, to adopt this straight away, uh, that they can. And, and that's kind of what I'm being asked at the moment, because I think that, you know, COVID and the lockdown and the remote working, uh, Bethany has, has caught some leaders on the hop. You know, they, they they can't open their office door anymore and find that their team are assembled in front of them. They're they're having to do this. They're having to use Zoom or, uh, or or other tools, and they need some sort of structure to lean into. So we we could think about grow or uh, a quick Google of sort of coaching structures will throw up um, hundreds uh, of these things. They're all sort of variations on the thing though. Cause they're about questioning. They're about tapping into. Uh, other people than having all the answers yourself and then uh, particularly uh, because we're doing a lot of this remotely at the moment again I think it's important in my experience to recognize that when we're not um, communicating face to face and together physically we, we do miss out on some of the cues and clues of body language and other things that we're probably not even conscious of um, good though zoom and teams and these other platforms are that they're not the same as being face to face with people in, in the room you know and we do have to i guess in some ways compensate for that um, and that tends to mean a bit more listening you know really trying to tune into what we can hear and, and think about the words that people are using and the tone that they're uh, they're using alongside that mm -hmm. yeah oh, cheers for that matt so in terms of like looking at some of those frameworks that you just mentioned as well, one of the things that I think everyone will appreciate as well with, with business is that it's very time scarce in many occasions. And, you know, does it not just take a little bit too much time to actually start to understand these frameworks and um, methodologies? Um, and, and is it a little bit too difficult to take on? Um. Well, again, I suppose it, it depends how how deep you want to go. Um, I think the answer to this one, I mean, it, it's going to sound a bit trite again, but 
you know, a lovely simple analogy is the idea of children with loose uh, shoelaces, you know, and when they're very, very small, we tend to, you know, laces come undone and we'll bend down and tie it for them because it's quick and easy to do that. You know, it takes a lot longer to spend the time where you could enable them to tie shoelaces for themselves. But at some stage, you're going to do that because you think, oh, I don't want to be doing this job of tying shoelaces all my life. You know, it's time that, that they learn for themselves. So um, I suppose it, it, with all of these things, it, it's wrestling. What do I do in the here and now versus can I spend perhaps a little bit time up front? Um, that's an investment. I'm going to get that time back down the line because I'm building my, my people's capability. I think it does take a little bit longer initially. It takes longer to help people find their own way through a problem, perhaps, than it does to say, I've encountered this before and, and I'm going to answer it for you. Yeah, it can take longer to do that. But the other thing in, in answering it for them, and we've already said that presupposes that you've got an answer. Um, it presupposes that you can do the job of translation of getting that out of their head and, and into, out of your head and into theirs. And it also presupposes that this problem that you think your guy has got is exactly the same as the one you had some years ago when you were in that job or whatever. Well, you know what, I think the world is moving rather too fast now to assume that something we encountered back in the day is exactly the same now. So you know i would argue perhaps it'd be better to uh, enable people to find their own way because that's then going to be unique to them and it's also going to be very current because they're dealing with the circumstances today exactly as they as they're encountering them today i agree and i know you touched on this briefly with them um, you know not being able to pick up on all the cues is what you would face to face so what yeah. other common challenges are being experienced by leaders when coaching from a distance um Tiredness, I think. <laughs> I've been reading quite a lot around uh, Zoom fatigue. Um, present company accepted, uh, <laughs> of course, you know. But uh, yeah, joking apart, I think this is uh, is really quite interesting to me because um, I, I've had a chat with a couple of leaders recently, and as we might expect, you know, they want to do coaching stuff, but they're tending to leave those to perhaps the end of the day where things are a bit quieter. But they might be having a coaching call using Zoom or Teams or something, having done four or five already that day. And they're absolutely exhausted. Now, I wouldn't pretend to understand the neuroscience of that, although I gather there are uh, things like, you know, having to compensate for almost a microscopic mismatch between what we hear and, and, and what we see. We're probably not aware of that consciously, but our brain is working quite hard. Um, there's something around which I think is quite interesting as well. The fact that when we're talking to people uh, normally face to face, you can't see yourself unless you habitually have a mirror in front of you. So I'm talking to you guys now, but you know, clamoring for my attention there in the corner of my screen is a little picture of me, and I'm wondering, you know, is too much grey hair showing through or whatever. You know, we're not conscious of those things normally. So I think that when we're using uh, video calling as a way of handling these kind of meetings and interactions, they are more tiring than perhaps we expected when we scheduled them all. So uh, this is a very convoluted way of asking you a question. I think the biggie, the big challenge that leaders are finding with coaching um, using these sorts of tools is that it, it's more taxing than they realised and they may perhaps need to schedule it early in the day where they're less fresh or maybe not have so many Zoom calls with clients or whatever in the day when they want to have a coaching style or performance review type discussion uh, with a member of their team because they're going to be they're going to be too tired. That's the the danger. Mm -hmm. Would you, in your opinion, then um, would you say that there's any one particular platform that you think performs the best, or is it just simply you know often better to just pick up the phone for some of the reasons that you were just discussing? Well, yeah, I mean, you, you turned over two pages there. I mean, I'm personally, I'm finding Zoom uh, really, really good. It's, it's dead easy. You know, you, you can pick it up and be good to go in, in next to no time. Uh, personally, I find some of the others, um, Teams and Adobe Connect, the, these kind of platforms a little bit uh, over-egged, uh, I think, for a simple coaching conversation. So Zoom is really good, but you know, um, a good old fashioned phone call it really, really helps. It kind of, um, I think it breaks this, uh, this sort of magic spell that somehow Zoom has um, 
placed us all under a good old fashioned phone call, particularly if it's a, a short call, um, like a check in, Jamie, uh, how's you doing? You know, maybe, maybe we don't need the full blown um, video to video context there. Uh, I, I think it's really, I find that I've kind of fallen into this cadence quite naturally as I might have, I, I see a lot of kind of, clients on a, a kind of month by month basis so we might have a, a fairly lengthy zoom call at one point in the month and then maybe a catch-up or two um, just over the phone because they only need to be for a few minutes so I think mixing and matching like you suggest there could be a really good idea yeah it feels like sometimes with a phone call it's a nice comfort blanket over you it's quite nice yeah. actually yeah I mean why not you know yeah. um, just again just because we can doesn't mean that we we, we should and uh I think it, it, it sort of breaks things up and I, I'm all for as well, just, just breaking out patterns. I mean, uh, coaching in many ways is getting, about getting people to think in more innovative ways. So if we only ever do things in the same old way, you know, people's thinking can get quite easily stuck in a rut. So sometimes it's nice to break a pattern uh, and just handle something in a slightly different way because that increases the chances that uh, a new idea might emerge or some fresh thinking yeah. Um, particularly if we're more relaxed. I mean, the old adage is you have your best ideas when you're in the shower or the bath. That's because that's we're more relaxed. And um, there are a lot of people as well. I found I was on a Zoom call the other day. It was a kind of networking thing. And a lot of people were clearly very, very uncomfortable with, with being on camera. I mean, it yeah. isn't for everybody's <laughs> taste, you know. So, um, again, I think a, a guiding coaching principle is do, do what's best for the other person. You know, check in with them, see how they'd prefer... Uh, perhaps to handle a particular conversation rather than assuming that everything has to be done in the same way all the time. Yeah. yeah. And so when would coaching perhaps not be the best approach for leaders to use? Um, well, I'm tempted to say never. Uh, <laughs> it, it's, you know, it's, it's a magic wand. It's a silver bullet. Um, but, but it isn't. Uh, there are times when perhaps it wouldn't be the, the, the best technique. And the two that spring most readily to mind is probably in an emergency. So I, I know it's a bit of a, a kind of cliched example, but um, if we were working in a building and the fire alarm started sounding, this would not be time for a coaching conversation where everyone could sit around and, you know, get a coffee and have a chat and debate what would be the best options for exiting the building. <laughs> in those sort of extreme circumstances, somebody needs to take the lead and, and keep everybody safe. So in an emergency is perhaps um, uh, one exception. The other time would be with a complete novice, uh, somebody who's brand, brand, brand new to the role with no prior experience at all. It would be much more difficult to get them going in the early days with a purely coaching approach because mm -hmm. coaching works best when you're helping people make best use of their experience. So they, they need to have gotten wet before we can coach them on their swimming you know they, they need to be in the pool splashing around and have some early experience that we can then uh, work with so going back to your early question around the difference between coaching and training is we probably would want to do training in the early days to give people some basic tools and techniques to go um, to get going with then coaching comes into its own when we're helping people make best use of that uh, training yeah, so the, the, the two kind of go side by side. The, the, the trouble is, I think, in most places of work is we can get stuck into that sort of training habit as if the only way that we can develop people is to keep giving them stuff. You know, not activating that coaching approach, help them learn from their own experience. And the tendency in the world of work to treat everything as if it's an emergency, you know, as if there's never any time um, to sit down and take stock and, and review and reflect and think about things in a more circumspect way. You know, we get into this habit of got to solve it now, got to solve it now. Um, and when we fall into that habit, we, we miss out, in my view, on these opportunities to really think something through and perhaps come up with a solution that's going to solve a problem permanently rather than just continually papering over the cracks. Yeah. So would you say then that you could use caution within a performance review? Yeah, I would. I mean, I, I think that a good coaching conversation is a performance review. I mean, if we go back to the, the GROW technique, um, which again is goals, uh, reality, options and will, I mean, those are four stages of a conversation that we'd cover off in a performance review anyway. We'd probably do the first two bits the other way around and talk about the reality or, if you like, what has happened 
it would be usual, wouldn't it, to start with that part of the conversation at the outset of a performance review, and then we might do the goal setting piece for the next period at the end. Um, but Grow was never designed to be in a linear sequence necessarily. I mean, it, it works well that way because it, it helps to spell grow, but you can have any of the four parts, you know, and sort of address them um, in any order that seems natural to the conversation. So coaching lends itself very well to, uh, or, or the structure of coaching lends itself very well to a performance review. And in terms of the skills and behaviors, asking people questions about their own experience, listening carefully to the answer, observing how they, handle themselves when they ask the question, of course, you know, that's, mm -hmm. that's absolutely what we should be doing in a, in a performance review as well, particularly if it's a very healthy type of performance review and a healthy type of performance review, in my opinion, would be one that concentrates on the person and is less concerned with filling out forms and ticking boxes or, or the electronic equivalent of doing that. You know, I think that uh, those sorts of performance reviews that just become reduced to a, a ticky box exercise don't, really do anyone any any favors it's really about the quality of the conversation and, and how can we help people learn from their experience and be very very clear and focused about what they want to go on to do next yeah have you had any sorry Bethany um yeah have you had any um experience of those who don't particularly want to be coached or I've got um, a problem with it and you know how would you have uh, gone about resolving that yeah, I mean, the, the, the short answer is, is yes, I have had those experiences, uh, painfully so. Um, I think a lot of what I most learned about coaching was perhaps to, to try it out on people that really weren't up for it. You know, um, I remember a young guy I worked with back in my corporate life and uh, I, I, I tried to coach him. Um, I'd just been on my coach training, you know, so I came back to work armed with all these techniques and I thought I'm going to start coaching everybody who who can't get out of the way now you know this guy i remember just sort of sat in front of me impervious to all of my brilliantly formed coaching question um and and it was it was quite unfortunate because it was almost if he was thinking coach me i bet you can't you know and, yeah, yeah. And, and by the time i eventually gave up it was like look i've won you you haven't coached me um i, I think i've subsequently learned uh, over the years jamie that it's a bit of a, a thankless task you know if if people aren't prepared for whatever reason to sort of enter into a coaching style conversation um, willingly and with, with some desire to kind of want to engage and, and, and meet you at that level, then it doesn't matter how skilled you are at uh, sort of asking the, the questions and so on, it, it, it isn't going to work. And, and there are people, unfortunately, who are beyond the reach of even the best coaching. And, and obviously where that's happening in a, in a work situation, well, we need to think of something else to do to to address that. So the other thing that I often find myself saying to, to leaders who want to take a coaching approach uh, at work is there will still be times, I'm afraid, where you might need a harder edge technique. You know, there are still going to be performance issues. There will still be times when you might need to give somebody a telling off or even instigate a disciplinary or something like that. You know, coaching, unfortunately, um, does not take away uh, the circumstances where those things um, might not still be appropriate but even when we have to do that you know if you can then use a harder edge technique to perhaps help people wake up and, and, and smell the coffee then when they're willing you know, saying to you look Jamie I realize I've, I've messed up here can you please help me kind of deal with this because I'm really struggling well then yeah then, then coaching is going to be um, a great tool to use but it does require this this meeting of equals you know and a um, an equal desire to want to engage in a, in a conversation built on trust that's about moving yeah. people forward. Yeah, in, in, in that sense, um, Matt, you, I know you've mentioned the GROW model earlier, but um, are there any other coaching models that could be applied in the workplace that could even actually help mitigate some of what we just talked about? Um, well, th th there are, yeah. I mean, I, I have a version of uh, GROW that... that, that that I sort of tweaked a little bit and I call it arrow. So the, the only real uh, difference there is I've got A for aims instead of goals because I, I think with, with goals, we get a little bit hit up in kind of KPIs and things like that and, and the belief that it's all about numbers. Well, if somebody wants some coaching on their self-confidence, for example, that's not an easy thing to kind of quantify, you know? So I prefer to use the idea of, of, of aims. 
Um, I've got a second R in there for reflection because I do believe that when we're coaching in the work situation, we need to create this time for, for people to, to think and, and, and reflect and, and kind of go over. And then my W in arrow is for, for way forward rather than will, but they kind of describe the same thing. Um, there's, a, there's some lovely sort of feedback models as well that are out there. There's a great one, um, that the, the, the three E's um, is, a, is a great way of organizing some feedback. And often we need to do that uh, at the start of the conversation. So that would be for, uh, let me get this right, um, uh, experience, uh, emotion and expectation. So uh, we talk to people about what they've done. This is my experience of, of the action that you took. The emotion is, and this is how it made me feel. The third E expectation is, so next time, would you please, dot, dot, dot. So, yeah, hundreds of them, hundreds of them. You know, <laughs> if we had more time, yeah, uh, we could get into all of those. But uh, as ever, a quick Google um, will we'll bring them all up. Yeah. And we've had a question come through there saying, how do you strengthen self-confidence, assertiveness and well-being through coaching? Right, great, okay, uh, great, great. Could you just repeat that again, Bethany, just so I've got those three components in my... Yeah, so it's how do you strengthen self-confidence, assertiveness, and well-being through coaching? Right, yeah, so those are, those are sort of three different things, I suppose, but the, the, the common thing that, that we would do, I think, with the coaching approach, and, and, and one of the one of the principles that the grow technique and asking questions and these other things uh, work on is the idea of raising awareness. So a great coaching question is going to cause people to stop and think about their situation and it's going to help them become more aware of what's happening to them uh, and how they feel about it. So the old expression goes, before we can change anything, we have to become aware of how it is now. So when we're getting into things like you know bad habits and and, and people continuing to use behaviours that uh, that aren't good for them and aren't helpful to them, one of the the problems that's often at play is that they're just not aware of it. You know, they're, they're not conscious of these um, triggers. They're not uh, seeing the signs of the sorts of things that happen in their environment that might make them angry or or, or anxious. So the first thing that we would do through, through coaching in order to help people move away from that is help them become aware of how it is now. And the, the R for reality in uh, the grow technique is perhaps the stage of questions that, that we would do that. Um, the other thing then that coaching is very good for, for helping people address those sorts of things is it can, it can help them take baby steps, you know? So with something like confidence, um, if you can just get at the kind of the, the W for way forward or willingness stage, just some agreement to take an action that might have people needing to do something that's slightly outside of their comfort zone, but in a, in a measured, in a controlled, in a gentle, for a better, uh, want of a better word, way, then that's how we build confidence, right? You know, confidence is a product of, of having a success and knowing we were responsible for that success. So you, you give people little building blocks of confidence and a coaching conversation then is going to do those two things really elegantly. Firstly, it's going to help people come to an awareness of how things are for them now. So then they can plot the path to, to change and improvement. And it's going to help them think through some action steps that can start moving them forward in a, in a measured way. And of course, sandwiched between those two things is another great coaching principle, which is responsibility. It's, it's, it's down to them, right? You know, you can't repair uh, somebody's confidence on their behalf. At, at some stage, they're going to have to do, uh, take some steps themselves. And so the coaching role is about being alongside people as they do that, uh, rather than taking a problem away from them and, and doing it for them. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, yeah, that was great. We've actually had another question come through as well. Um, are there any books you'd recommend managers to read? <laughs> well, I've written some. So <laughs> um, that's, yeah, um, well, yes, there, there are. I mean, probably the, the industry standard uh, coaching book is uh, by a guy called uh, Sir John Whitmore, who anybody uh, involved in coaching in the UK will have heard of. And his, uh, his book, Coaching for Performance, which I think is on its fifth edition now, uh, first published in 93, 94, I'd have to check. Um, it is probably seen as the Bible, uh, I think, in terms of, uh, of applying coaching techniques. But um, that was it itself inspired by 
um, the work of a, a guy called Tim Galway. And Tim Galway, some people might have heard of. He was behind the, the inner game techniques, which gave rise to uh, a lot of what we understand by modern coaching and, and inspired uh, Sir John to, to do his work and write his book. So Galway, very, very briefly, he was... Um, he was the, the coach at a, a, a country club. He was the tennis coach at a country club in California. And he discovered an interesting thing one time, which was actually, um, he, he was quite tired at the end of one particular session and, and was tired of listening to the sound of his own voice and just stopped giving all these instructions. But noticed that actually then the people that he was teaching began to improve much more naturally and he thought well this is really interesting I'm supposed to be the coach but if I just sort of shut up and allow people to hit some balls they, they seem to be getting yeah. um, better more quickly that's kind of odd what the hell could explain that and then he kind of got into um, uh, I suppose understanding some of the the science some of the sports psychology that we've got now around how it is that people learn and improve um, and he wrote about his findings in a book published in uh, the late 70s called The Inner Game of Tennis. And sometimes when people say to me, so what's the best book on uh, business coaching that you recommend? And I say The Inner Game of Tennis. And what the hell is the book on tennis uh, got to do with coaching? Well, the tennis bit is, is almost irrelevant. You know, it just so happened that that was the context in which uh, Tim Galway made his discoveries about how it is that we that adults learn and how therefore we can coach for their development. So don't be put off by the, the, the tennis of the title. This is a book about um, improving performance and overcoming mental obstacles. Um, because coaching, just to go off a side road, is about helping people play those, those inner games. You know, people, they get in their own way. Um, it's what's going on in their own heads that's often the thing that, that most holds them back. So two books, Coaching for Performance by uh, Sir John Whitmore and The Inner Game of Tennis by Tim Galway. And if you read out of those, and I, I, they're out of arm's reach, or I'd get them down and put them on screen. Uh, but, uh, you know, I've got my, my copies of those two are, are very, very well thumbed. Um, but but there, are, there are dozens, and again, all, all very, very good. We've got another question as well which is quite an interesting one and i'll be really interested to hear your response on it okay. but can you coach your boss <laughs> i wonder who's asked that <laughs> um right okay so uh, let's let's just have the um the caveat again from from earlier on just because you can doesn't mean that you, you should so uh, be careful with it. it depends on the boss i mean yes you know the, the techniques are the techniques and just on a wider point, Jamie, you know, coaching is, is agnostic about um, who, who is more or less senior, you know, so we, we could possibly get into the, to some interesting debate around the, the, the multiple directions in which coaching can flow. It certainly doesn't have to come from somebody more senior to somebody less so or from somebody outside to somebody inside, which means that, yes, you, you can coach your boss, but I would probably caution against sort of labelling it that. Um, because bosses being bosses could, would, would, might sometimes get a little bit uh, cross, I suppose. But, you know, you don't, have to, you don't have to call it coaching to use the techniques. I mean, it, we're talking about asking people some provocative questions and listening carefully to the answers, knowing that that kind of quality of conversation is going to be very useful. So, yeah, why not? You know, I just perhaps wouldn't say, please sit down, boss, because I'm going to coach you for the next yeah. four five minutes. That might not be a great career move. But yeah. in theory, you know, in, in terms of the, the philosophy of coaching, absolutely, yeah. And uh, I, I know people have done that. You know, it can be quite a subtle way of changing the nature of that, that sort of boss team member uh, relationship. And I'll just, just to build on that really quickly, but is there, you know, um, if you're delivering this coaching with authenticity, that, that could be the difference between something that's more contrived. Because I think people, if they feel that they're being, you know, talked to from a textbook, it could be more challenging than if it is more authentic um, and intrinsic. Yeah, uh, agreed. I mean, it, it, it can be. So I, I have a lot of people I've worked with through the years who have come on a program with me, you know, and they often, they often worry about this. Is I want to when I first do some coaching, it, it's going to seem a bit stilted. And I've got this list of example questions that you gave me on a handout, but I don't really want to have that with me. But, you know, equally, everybody's got to learn, I suppose. And in the same way as when we first learned to drive, we've got to think long and hard about 
the gear stick and it's going to crunch and be a bit bumpy and our passengers might get a bit uh, uh, irritated by that. But so it has to be, you know, but I think as long as our, our, um, our aims are sincere, then we can kind of get past that. And um, the, the, the way to check for it, in my experience, is to just from time to time, just check in with our own motives. You know, I and mean, if I go back to the guy I was telling you about who seemed to be impervious to my coaching, well, maybe it's because he realized it was being driven by my ego a little bit. You know, I'd come back from my own training and I was going to coach this guy whether he wanted to be coached or not. That was my stuff, not his. Perhaps if I'd uh, been more alive to what you're suggesting and had been a little bit more sincere and my intention had been to help, um, then it might have been very different. So, so that's the check mechanism. What is my intention here? Why am I going to sit down with you, Jamie or Bethany, and, and, and try to do this? And if the answer to that question in your own head is anything other than to help them, then you, you need to be cautious, you know, and you perhaps need to, uh, to think about your own motives. And someone else has asked, are there any exercises leaders can use to help employees get out of their own way? Yeah, I mean, coaching, I suppose, is, is, is ultimately um, an exercise in that. Um, some, some coaching questions around things like, you know, uh, what, what's holding you back? Um, what have you tried before? What, what results could you get? Um, more encouraging coaching questions about, you know, if you, if you try this and you crash and burn, what, what, what's your backup plan? Um, these are all ways of helping people get out of their own way by encouraging them to, to take a step in a different direction. Um, we, we, we do have this habit of getting in, in our own way um, because we hear that little voice in our head that's saying, mm, you know, be careful. Who do you think you are? You tried this before and it didn't work. Um, the antidote to that is, is not to, you, you can't really get, get rid of that voice, I, I don't think, unless you're going to submit to sort of endless hypnotherapy or something like that. But what you can do is, is quieten the voice down and, um, and, and uh, shush it and, and have it becoming less obvious to you by, by doing something else, you know, by taking an action and giving your mind something much more useful uh, to think about and focus on than, than taking notice of this little voice that, that's going to keep you small. And so how do you help leaders then to become effective coaches for their employees? And do you have any examples of this? Yeah, so until quite recently, um, I, I was, was kind of running workshops on this. You know, I, I'd done that for uh, a long, long time. And um, funnily enough, just before uh, uh, COVID, although COVID has only accelerated my process, I've started doing fewer workshops and more um, coach training on a on a one to one basis because what I was finding is that some leaders, particularly I suppose if they were fairly senior in their organisation, were were quite reluctant to come on a program, um, because it felt as if they were having to uh, address a weakness in public. Now there are all sorts of reasons why you would say, well look, don't worry about that, and it's actually really healthy for the culture of your organisation for you, Mr or Mrs senior leader, to go through the same development as other people are doing, but you know, there, there are reasons why they wouldn't want to do that. So it's quite interesting to me that my work has, has evolved and is evolving into doing much more um, coach development on a one-to-one -one basis that can then be very, very bespoke to that person um, than, than by attending workshops. Attending workshops is quite difficult at the moment. We can do coaching style webinars and things, but uh, at the end of the day, you, you, you need to practice with other people and that's quite a difficult thing to to, to, to replicate online, although I'm sure other people like me are, are beginning to figure that out. Um, but what I am finding, Bethany, which I suppose is quite interesting in terms of the conversation today, is you know, the, the requests for that sort of help um, have not disappeared through COVID. I think a lot of leaders are recognising quite quickly that, that, you know, as we come through this, because I think hopefully the emergency stage of this is, is behind us, I certainly hope, hope so that there's now this kind of recover, recovery and um, uh, and ultimately a movement back towards sort of prosperity and growth again it's going to require a different sort of, of leadership and it's uh, if the leader as expert idea that we spoke about at the start of this call is gone then it's surely the leader as coach that's gonna uh, gonna spring up in its place yeah 
Well, thank you, Matt, for joining us today. It's been really valuable. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add before we go? Um, no, not really. Uh, I guess you've gone through all of the, uh, of the questions. I'd be happy um, to circulate some contact details. Uh, at the end, I guess you have those anyway. You can put those around the attendees. Uh, I'm very active on LinkedIn and, and other places if anyone wants to kind of continue the conversation uh, with me outside of this and, and talk about their specific situation, then I'm happy to help if I, if I possibly can. Great. Well, thank you, Matt, and thank you all for watching. If you'd like any more information, we have a number of articles and how-to guides to businesses. If you go to our website at www.weareumi.co.uk, and we'll also circulate Matt's details as well. And thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye.